Good morning friends. Welcome to the second history lecture and in this lecture we would be discussing the 1857 revolt and the socio-cultural reforms in the 18th and the 19th century. So we start with the 1857 revolt. Some people called it the first war of independence. Some people call it uh, the Sepoy mutiny. But the reality of 1857 is somewhere in between both these extremes. So neither it is the first war of independence because you know the, the concept of India was not like the modern day concept that we have for India. It was not present in the 19th century. And you can also not call it a sepoy mutiny because you know it's just not the soldiers who took part in the uh, in the revolt. They were they were other people. They were peasants. They were zamidars. They were kings. They were common people who took part in that. So it's it it will be very unfair to call 1857 revolt as just a sepoy mutiny. So let us first start with the. Uh, causes of the 1857 revolt. So first is the political causes. So when we talk of political causes, the first reason is the conquest. So as you know that, you know, in the first 30, 40 years, as we have understood in the last lecture, that till 1813, the British had a policy which was very defensive, which was a policy where their only aim was to defend and consolidate whatever territory they have they were not they, they were not lusty about you know capturing new territories they, they 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 had no i mean the reason why they they had they fought against marathas was because marathas were threatening their territory in the south india the reason why they fought against mysore was because mysore was threatening their territory in the south india so the i mean every war which they did for the first 60 70 years the main reason for that war was to defend what it has either to defend what it has or to create a buffer state between the enemy so for, for example if there is the british territory then just next to the, the british territory the east india company wanted a friendly neighbor because if they would not be a friendly labor, they would always be a threat of war. So, but after 1813, when Lord Wesley, after Lord Wesley, Lord Hastings came to power, you know, the British abandoned the policy of defense. They became more offensive, which meant they had a dream of capturing all over the India. They had a dream of territorial expansion. And this policy was shaped by or it was shaped further by lord dalhousie so lord dalhousie was a very big imperialist he wanted to capture each and every part of the indian mainland he was a determined patriot he was against this indirect rule where there would have been you know there would have been a state which would have had a british resident and it would have a little bit of autonomy like our what he wanted was ki main seedha kabza karu ki seedhe jo rule ho wo seedhe british crown ka rule rahe wahan pe koi indirect rule na rahe koi you know we don't rule through proxies let there be a in, let there be a direct rule so this naturally you know alienated this naturally alarmed the indian princes because the indian princes believed that you know till that they believed that if we are friendly with the british the british will not touch us but he started the policy of conquest. He he captured Punjab, you know, and then it, there was Sin, which was also captured. So all these, you know, kind of naturally angered the people there. The second political reason why which instigated the revolt was the policy of doctrine of lapse, which was also the policy of Lord Dalhousie. So according to the doctrine of lapse ideology. He believed that any state which does not have a natural hair, which does not have a natural hair, they would automatically be annexed by the British or by the East India Company. So it violated the Hindu order because Hindu order always said that, okay, even if you don't have a natural hair, you can always have an adopted, you can always adopt a kid and that adopted kid would have all the uh, facilities or all the privileges of a natural born son. 
So this naturally under this pretext, number of states were annexed by the East India Company and these include the states of Satara, Jaipur, Sambalpur, Bhagat, Udaipur, Jhasi and Nagpur. So all these states were annexed on the pretext of doctrine of Nabs. Naturally the rulers, the, the, the Rajas, the Nawabs of these states they did not like that they, they you know they did not enjoy this you know their territory being annexed and naturally they fought against the British. Also the kingdom of Awadh the annexation of Awadh also played an important role in the revolt because see most of the people in the East India Company they were actually most most of them were from Awadh and and these people they always respected the Nawab. The Nawabs of Awadh were a very secular people. They were they believed in what we call as Ganga, Jamna, Tajib. They played Holi. They played Diwali. You know there was uh, a saying at that time when you know it uh, when 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 last Nawab of Awadh, Wajid Ali Shah, when he was being taken, you know when he was captured by the British, there were rumors that he was being taken to London. And the Hindu women in Lucknow, they went to the temple and they prayed and they, you know, kind of sang that Hazrat Kajate and London, Kripa Karu Raghunandan, which meant that the Lord is going to London, please, you know, Lord Krishna, please help him and take care of him. So it, it showed the kind of respect the, the, the Nawabs of Awadh had among the Hindus and the Muslims of the Awadh. And naturally, when Awadh was annexed, it hurted the feelings, sentiments of, you know, the army people and these army people, they were also, you know, when they came back, they were, you know, kind of orchestratized, they were kind of treated badly because he said, you are serving in an army which annexed our, which, you know, which captured our king. So naturally, these people, these soldiers, they were angry and they, you know, fought against the British. Fourthly, there was also humiliation of uh, Mughals. So, lots. So, see, by the end of or by the middle of 18th century, the power of Mughals have ended, which I have already said in the last lecture that there was the saying that, you know, he was Shah Alam and his rule is only from, uh, you know, Redford to Kapalam. So, they were already very weak. All their territory were kind of captured by these autonomous states, but they had a respect. They, the, the British knew that these people have ruled over this territory for over 200 years and they command a lot of respect among the Hindus and the Muslims. And therefore, we should, okay, we should make them powerless, but we should not treat them, you know, in a humiliating way. We should respect them. And that is what all the, all the people, so even by, in the 19th century, the, the name of the king and the photo of the Mughal emperor was on the th th coin. But since the time of, you know, our, since the time of Akbar II, who was the father of Badr Shah Jafar, the British started some humiliation of the Mughals. They started, you know, they, they removed the photo of the king from the coin. Later on, Lord Talauzi went to extreme and he said that after you, so he said to Badr Shah Jafar, after you, uh, there would be no such, there, there would be no king, you know, there would be, you cannot appoint a here, you will be the last king and also uh, you would have to vacate your palatial residence at Redford and you will have to live in a more modest or your, your successors will have to live in a more modest accommodation in Delhi. So this humiliating treatment, I think if you have time, you should read a book which is called as The Last Mughal by William Dalrampil. And it talks about how, you know, how much powerless, uh, you know, Bhadru Shah Jafar had become. I mean, a person who is the direct descendant of Timurid and, and Changez Khan have become so powerless that he has to ask for British to for even, you know, minute amount of 500 rupees and 1000 rupees. So it was a very sorry tale of the last Mughal and the, and the Delhi at, at the, that time. So all those who have some interest in history, they should read that book. So naturally, this this treatment of Badr Shah Jafar was not liked by the uh, 
you know it was not liked by the uh, by the muslims and by the hindus because they have they have always thought him as a very because he was also a very pious man i mean bahadur shah zafar was a very secular and very you know he was a very pious man he lived like a sufi he was a uh, poet when he died you know uh, he wrote a poetry that kitna badnaseeb hai zafar do gach zameen bhi na mili kuwai yaar mein ki how you know how unfortunate is zafar that he has not even got two piece of land two piece of land in the land of his beloved because he was you know his he, he died in rangoon and he always wanted to come back to india and want to spend his last days in india because he loved india he was you know this is what actually is uh, getting wrong these days when people say that these moguls they came from outside i mean see babar came from outside but later on all of them they made india as a country and they became as much indian as anyone else so his treatment was not really liked by the people and therefore you know it was uh, it they it motivated them to fight against the british and last is the suspension of pension so the pension of nana saheb who was the adopted son of the peshwa the pension of uh, of jhansi uh, lakshmi uh, i mean rani lakshmi bai all of them were sus- uh, suspended and naturally i mean they had no option but to fight or they they had two options either to die in poverty or to fight and they chose the latter next we have is the administrative causes so first is the rule of law so the, the british created the rule of law in india before they came there was no rule of law it was all the whims and fancies of the ruler if the ruler wanted somebody to be beheaded without any court without any trial he would be beheaded in in like 5 minutes but the british stays that they they brought they brought rule of law which means there would be a proper book there would be a proper book of law and you can only act according to the law you cannot go beyond the law you cannot take any decision beyond the law even though you know it was all sham because the trial was all sham i mean it was not a free and fair trial but still they followed the procedure but the problem was that that indians at that time they were not that much educated they were not that much aware and when this rule of law came it also created a new profession called as lawyer so it became really tough for these common people to use these new modern uh, you know kind of system because they had to pay the lawyer they don't understand the law they were illiterate and it was a very costly affair they have to pay the lawyer and the case would go on for 2 3 years and they have to pay the lawyer fees every time all this was very costly because the earlier system of justice was was very free it was free first of all and it was very fast if you had any problem you have to go to the local zamindar and the other party would come and the fastla would be on the spot so within 1 hour 2 hour they would be decision done but this new system was very complicated for them they had to you know wait for 2 3 years and they have to pay the money to lawyers but and they they are not able to understand the law and because of this they were exploited many of them you know they, they they on a piece of paper they used to put their thumb and that piece of paper was actually nothing but the transfer of the land so many of the educated indians exploited them many of the british people exploited them and all all these things made them more resentment towards the british rule and therefore they joined the mutiny next administrative reason is the unpopular to british administration so the the you know the administration before that was very accessible as i have told you that zamindars in the mughal uh, era they were they were considered as the socio political leaders they used to meet the people every day they were they were very friendly towards the people but these new lat sahibs so this term lat sahib came from them only lat sahib you know uh, maiba so these people these term these feudal terms came from this era when these you know englishmen these civil servants they were they thought that they are you know just the 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 incarnation of the god and therefore they have no other uh, no other work but to play golf play tennis and play kind of all these good stuff so the gap between the common man and the administration was very high 
and then you know whenever they used to go to them for for their grievances they were treated in a very bad manner they were they 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 received racial taunts and all these made the all these things made the administration very unpopular and it increased the resentment again in, among the people and thirdly there was exclusion of indians from the administrative posts so you know no indian could reach the post higher than the sdm no indian can reach the post higher than the munsif magistrate the bureaucracy the judiciary the politics everywhere i mean there was no kind of politics but technically the bureaucracy and the police the, the judiciary the army everywhere indians were excluded from the top only the most you know the most subordinate posts were given to the indians and naturally this was not liked by the indians and the reason was that the british you know there was this thought there was this racial theory which developed at that time which believed that indians are not really they are not uh, you know suitable for this job and plus they are not someone who should be trusted so this racial attitude naturally alienated indians and this angered the the people because they thought that it's our country and we are not able to because beat any beat any rule hindu rule muslim rule any rule indians were always you know reaching the top levels they were ministers they were governors it's the first time it happened that a administration came and completely excluded the indians beat hindus beat muslims beat anyone next is the ec next is economic causes so economic causes i think i have already discussed a lot yesterday and i will discuss again in briefly so first is the ruin of the of the mercantile classes so as you know that because of the free trade because of you know uh, there was so much duty imposed on the india's export to europe and there was free there was no duty uh, of the you know european goods to india it naturally ruined the indian entrepreneurship it ruined the indian uh, business class it ruined the indian merchant class they became completely you know impoverished because they could not you know sell they could not produce you know there was what we call as deindustrialization of of indian economy there was all the people who were there in the secondary activities they shifted back to agriculture now when they shifted back to agriculture they created more problem for the agriculture because it created disguised unemployment there were 10 people doing the same job which required just two people so naturally you know since the total production was distributed among 10 people naturally it would mean that you know everybody would got a very less share right and then we have the peasants who were very much uh, in anger because of the failures in all the three system be it mahalwari be it rotwari and be it thapamal settlement all the three systems exploited them you know they had they were under the burden of debt they were under the uh, burden of high land revenue and therefore naturally it was in their interest to remove this new system and replace it with the old feudal system next is the social and religious causes so you know you have these social legislations which was responsible for eliminating indians so lord william bendict he came he banned sati he banned female infanticide and uh, later on uh, lord canning he banned uh, widow remarriage so naturally this was not liked by the orthodox indian you know there there are some good reasons why they were revolted but this was actually a stupid reason why they revolted because english people they actually you know uh, fought against these uh, these these you know superstitious activities they fought against these what we call as rotten kind of customs and we should give them credit that because of them india is uh, you know today free from these ills if they would have not come probably these ills would have continued till date so this was actually considered as an attack on the hinduism just like we see right now that hinduism khatre mein hindutva khatre mein hai 
So there were some crazy people at that time also who thought that you know Hinduism khatre mein hai, Islam khatre mein hai, and they rose their ranks and they you know also supported the revolt. Uh, also, there were two laws which were passed in 1832 and 1850, and it removed all the disabilities. So, if even if you convert from Hinduism to Christianity, you could still get all the share of your father's property. So, this naturally alarmed Indians because they thought that it's an it's an incentive, it's an indirect mechanism to actually incentivize the uh, the Indians to convert to Christianity. Next is the missionary activities. So uh, this is also something which is uh, which is also very much responsible. There were chapels in in all the army units, and the army people thought that they are being converted. The in 1813 Act it removed all the restrictions on the missionary activities of the Christians uh, or, or of the European missionaries. These the missionaries came to India. They settled down and they were they they, they attacked the the Hindu and the Muslim customs. They they always treated them with contempt. They thought that it's a it's 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 a it's all irrational kind of stuff there. And this actually alarmed the Indians because it hurted their feelings and it made them believe that these missionary activities or these missionaries are there with a mission to Christianize the Indians. And this was not liked by both Hindus and Muslims. And therefore, they you know. Uh, were were naturally alarmed. There was also uh, the rule which was declared that every educational institute would have a, a missionary. They would have, you know, every educational institute would uh, uh, have some, uh, you know, hours of missionary teaching every week. So the Hindus and the Muslims who send their kids there, they also became alarmed that you know it's also an uh, medium to convert their kids. Next we have is the military causes. So first reason is the service conditions. So the service conditions as you know was not really good. Uh, the army people they can they cannot reach, they cannot become the officer. They can only remain a they can only remain a sepoy. This was something which was which was happening first time in India that even you are very talented even if you are really talented, still you cannot become an officer. The only reason is because you have a brown race. Earlier than that, be it any ruler, any kingdom, talented people rose very, very high post. They became commanders, they became governors, I mean everywhere. But this is the first time it happened that only that you are you are a brown race, so that's why you cannot become an officer, you can only carry him in a sepoy. Also, the salary of of Indian soldiers were very less than the than the, the European soldiers. They were made to work for many hours a day, and they were they they they, they were given you know shabbily quarters. They were given less food, and also they were uh, you know uh, the, the British also interfered in their religious practices. For example, the Hindu soldier was was prohibited from wearing this forehead uh, what we call as tika on the forehead and the muslims were uh, were prohibited from keeping a beard because the british thought that we will create a very secular army which would be free from these religious things and that has, has actually continued even after independence so even now we are it is prohibited to have beards it is prohibited to have this tilak so this naturally you know most of the people in the army were from the upper caste and they were they did not like these restrictions next is the withdrawal of allowances so they were you know they were used to give an allowance for the extra work that they did and after a you know if they if they conquest any new Province they used to give in they used to give in a share of the booty they used to give in the extra allowance but this allowance was prohibited this allowance were abolished and they was they were told that they will be given fixed salary and there would be no further incentive which would be given to them 
this also was not liked by them and this also made them nervous. Next is the uh, the General Service Enlistment Act. So, according to this act, uh, you are you have to give undertaking in writing when you join the army that you would be served or you would be ready to be served in any places in India and abroad. So, you can serve in Africa, you can serve in Asia, you can serve in Myanmar, you can serve in Sindh, you can serve in Afghanistan. And this was also not liked by the Hindus, the, the upper caste Hindus, because they had a, at that time it was prevalent that if you cross seas, you would lose your caste, you will become polluted, you will meet with the Malikchas. And this was also not liked by the upper caste Hindu soldiers who believed that they will lose their caste and they would become a, a Varna because of this act and naturally the resentment was there. Also, so these are the reasons why the revolt or why people became so much angry, so much, they were so much agitated. Now they needed a spark to actually burst and the spark was created or the spark was given by a, by a new policy of the British which was the new Enfield rifle. New Enfield rifle when it came there was rumor which spread that when you have to open it you have to you know put this thing you know inside and then you have to open it with mouth the cartridge and that that cartridge was made of cow skin and pork meat. So this naturally hurted the feelings of both Hindus and Muslims and the, because for Hindus the cow is holy for Muslims the pig is unclean so naturally you know they both didn't like that and they actually it made them confident that British is following a proper strategy a proper policy of making us avarnas of making us you know non-Hindus and non-Muslims in order to ensure in order to force us to convert to Christianity. Now this thing naturally angered a person called Mangal Pandey and there have been stories, there have been you know a kind of uh, movies made on him uh, you know the real documents and the real thing says that he was a guy who was an opium addict and he was a very 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 kind of religious guy and when he heard about this thing that he, he had been chewing cow uh, from last many weeks, he became very angered and in the opium, you know, kind of um, thing, he went and he killed a soldier and this, you know, started the 1857 revolt and after that, you know, the, the, the soldiers in Meerut, they kind of revolted and they killed the, the officer of the British army and they started their journey towards the Delhi, they started, you know, towards Delhi, they reached Delhi and then they captured Delhi, they, they killed the, the, the resident of British in Delhi and all other officers have, had, had flown away and then they declared Bahadur Shah Zafar as their king. Bahadur Shah Zafar did not agree, he said that I am 83 years old, I have no power, I have no, I am just a emperor of India in the name, I have no, I'm, I have no territory, I have no army, I have no, no energy, I have no age with me. So how can I lead the, uh, you know, how can I lead the uh, war? But then they kind of force them that, see, you are, you are a symbol which can unite India because you have ruled, your family have ruled over 300 years and you are, you can unite all the regions, all the sections, all the, I mean, they were just like, or he was just like the Gandhi family of the Indian National Congress that without them, you know, no other people will unite. So he was forced to take the leadership but he actually did not play any role. It was actually done by his commander called Bakht Khan who was the person who was leading the army. So after that, after this uh, incident, the, the rebellion, it spread to all the northern and central India including Lucknow, Allahabad, Kanpur, Bareilly, Banaras, Jhasi, 
part of uh, Bihar and other places. So in all these places, the revolt was spread. So what is important for your uh, exam perspective is that you have to remember the center of revolt and the leaders associated with that place. So we can say this thing. So at Lucknow, it was done by uh, it, it was done by Begum Hazrat Mahal. Actually, about Lucknow, there is a very uh, interesting story. So when the British came to capture Lucknow, uh, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was. Uh, I mean, everybody was knew that they they were coming. So all the people in the palace they ran away. Only one who was left was Begum. Oh, who, who was left was Nawab Wajid Ali Shah. Now, when these people came, when the British people came, they said, Ki, "Everybody fled. You are the one who are remaining. Why didn't you fled?" So he said that I could have fled, but the problem was my servant had fled, and my shoes were there, and and he was the person who made me wear those shoes. And without that, how could I flee? So this reflects the kind of uh, that's why the term Nawab is used when when you don't when you become more you know lazy. Your mom and dad use the word Nawab. Can Nawab mat bano? Because Nawab symbolizes the lavishness, the you know the kind of you know pompousness, you know. So it's associated with that. So in Lucknow it was Begum Hazrat Mahal. At uh, at Kanpur it was Nana Sahib and Tantya Tope. At uh, uh, Jhansi, it was Lakshmi Bai. At uh, Jagdishpur in Bihar, it was Kuwar Singh. At uh, Faizabad, it is uh, Muhammad uh, Ahmadullah. At uh, Bareilly, it was Khan Bahadur Khan. Uh, at uh, uh, so all these and in Delhi, it was. Bakht Khan, who was leading the rebellion, so these were the centers of revolt, and these were the leaders of the revolt. In actually, and after so for three months, from May, from June till September, Delhi and India was at least not India was free from the British rule. India was liberated for three months, and you know the the Indian sepoys, the Indian soldiers, the Indian mutineers. They did. They treated the, the Britishers very badly. Many of them would be kind of beheaded. Their 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 wives and their children are also killed. But when the British captured back, they responded with even more kind of brutality. And it's a saying that between Allahabad to Benares, there was not a single tree in which they did not hang a person. So every in every tree they hang one person. They 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 were you know when they came back. They they found the uh, the family of Bahadur Shah Zafar and Bahadur Shah Zafar hiding at the Huma, at the Humayun's tomb, and you know then they took away the two they took away the two kids of Bahadur Shah Zafar and they shot him they they shot them point black and the place was at Khuni Darwaza in Delhi. And if somebody is from Delhi, you won't be aware of that place. That looks very haunted. If you have time, if you have come to Delhi, you should visit that place. So they were killed there. And later on, all of these, you know, Lakshmi Bai, everybody of Khatatya Tope, they were all hanged. They either were hanged or they they ran away or they kind of, you know, they kind of went into hiding. Bahadur Shah Zafar and his family was taken to Rangoon. So, what was the causes of failure of revolt? So, revolt of 1857 failed because of many reasons. The first reason was that there was, you know, it was very poorly organized, and there was no lack of, there was no unity among the rebel leaders. There was no unity. I mean, technically, to be really honest, to be really, you know. If you are if you are a historian or if you read history, you should actually take away your emotions. Your emotions should be completely out of that when you read history. You should not read history as a nationalist. You should read history as a uh, you know as a person who is uh, who is a rational person who would 
you know, who would judge things based on the facts, who would judge things based on the circumstances. And you can raise, and you can say that it was not actually a war of independence. There were people who were fighting the war. They were fighting for their own benefit. They wanted their kingdoms back. Zamidars wanted their land back. Talukdars wanted their land back. The peasants wanted a system where they don't have to pay that much land revenue. Everybody was fighting for their own benefit. Nobody, because the idea of India in a modern sense was not prevalent at that time. India was more of a geographical entity than more of a nation because you know everybody thought that we are from a different country. We are from Awadh, we are from Rohilkhand, we are from this country. Nobody actually thought that we are from India. They were fighting because they had one common enemy which was the British people and they all had their grievances against them. So the only thing, only you know purpose of this unity was that they want to remove these people. They want to remove these people and they want to replace them, they want to replace the British with a more decentralized India of the early 18th century. After Aurangzeb died, India was more of a decentralized state where there would have been a weak center power and there would have been autonomous states of uh, Awadh, Bengal, Hyderabad, Rohilkhand, etc. They wanted that. They did not want it, they, they did not want it to bring democracy, they did not want it to you know, give people freedom of right, freedom of expression. It was not like that. They wanted a decentralized state of the early 18th century to be again created in India. So naturally their ideals were not progressive. It's, it's regressive in nature. You know, they, they did not aim for a free or a very democratic country. And naturally this meant that the educated intelligentsia, the middle class, they were not there in the, they did not support the rebellion. They kept away from the rebellion because they thought that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a battle of few stupid people who are, some of them are fanatics of religion and some of them wanted, and some of them are sad because they, they their states have been taken away by the British. And no the rebellion can be successful if it does not have the support of the intelligentsia. You talk of French re re revolution, you talk of Russian revolution, you talk of American revolution. Can you take away the role of Mazzini? Can you take away the role of, 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 pe of you know, people like Rousseau? People like, you know, uh, uh, all these people. I mean, these are the people, these are the people who provided the ideological support for the uh, uh, revolution. And in the case of 1857, there was no ideological support because there was no ideology. Third reason is that they were fighting, you know, uh, against the army which was using a modern weapon. I mean, it was, uh, they were fighting with bayonets, they were, they were fighting with guns and you had most of the people fighting with swords. How could you fight, a, how could you fight against a gun with a sword? So naturally they were bound to get defeated. Fourth reason is the railway. Because of railways, the troops came very fastly or it came very swiftly from the uh, other places of India. If there would have no railways, they would have they would have come in bullock carts and that would have taken a lot of time and probably that would have made the recapturing part very difficult. And lastly, many of the Indian states many of the Indian princely states supported the British and that played a very important role in curbing the revolt. So there were Sindhyas, there were people from Hyderabad, the so-called Rajputs of, of uh, you know, the Rajput kingdoms of Rajasthan whose sentiments become very hurt when there is a movie which is released but they, they, their sentiments were not hurt when they sided with the British in the 19th century. Then there were people, they were king of Nepal, they were king of Kashmir, all of them support, there was uh, Nawab of Bhopal, all of them supported the, the British and uh, naturally this made uh, them very easy, they made, they, they, this made the task for the, the British very easily. So what was the impact of the revolt? So the first impact was that the, the British realized that now whatever we have, we will consolidate that because these princely states, they played a very important role as an ally. They, if they would have not been with us, 
we would have faced a very tough system we would have you know we would have got uh, uh, it would have been difficult for us to defeat the army so therefore they then realized that we have to treat them with respect and therefore the british abandoned the policy of further conquest and there was no further conquest after 1857 these princely states they were treated as allies and they were treated as a good solid partners for the efforts they showed in the 1857 revolt next is that the control of so the rule shifted from indirect rule of the crown to the direct rule of crown so east india company was replaced by direct rule from the british parliament and the uh, and the queen of england became the empress of india she became the empress of india and uh, the people or the 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 you know before the revolt the head of the indian affairs was the governor general later on it was the viceroy viceroy means he is a representative of the queen and there was also a secretary of state for indian affairs a post which was created who would who who would have a control over the uh, viceroy and he would be a minister of the british cabinet also there was indian council act 1858 and indian council act 1861 which was passed you would read more about the act in the chapter in which in in the lecture in which we will be discussing all the acts also the the indian army was reorganized the ratio of the european officers to the indian officers increased so it, it was i think 3 to 1 3 indian and 1 european it changed to 2 indian and 1 european soldier so that to keep the share not very different also uh, you know there was this concept of martial and non martial race which was which was developed after the 1857 revolt which meant that uh, you know after the 1857 revolt there were some races which were identified as martial races because they sided with the british in the revolt so there were like races like jats like sikhs like pathans like gurkhas and it was ensured that maximum recruitment in the army would come from these castes or these kind of tribes and this is the reason why you will see maximum number of people from these these castes in the indian army right now because they have a tradition of going to army from a long back and in army usually it happens that a son of an army officer or or a son of a army personnel will also go to army so therefore this because of this martial and non martial concept we still have a over representation of these castes and these communities also they started with the policy of associating indians in the legislative and the executive matters and therefore they they, they started to include some indians in the legislative council and vice roy's executive council also uh, it increased the racial bitterity between these two races the europeans the the english people started treating indians as people were unworthy to be to be trusted and therefore they you know would uh, they they uh, i mean they treated indians with contempt also they left the the policy of reforms in the social and religious affairs because they thought that this would alienate the indians and therefore after 1857 they became more of a status quoist they became more of you know they started supporting the regressive element they started supporting the orthodox element because they believe that these orthodox people are the real leaders of indians and they believe that these these people they cannot be trained they cannot be transformed they are beastly people therefore let them leave alone let their cult let them let them follow their own culture let them follow their own traditions we would not interfere also they started with the policy of divide and rule because ultimately 
1857 revolt is also known for a complete Hindu Muslim unity because in that revolt the Hindus accepted Bahadur Shah Zafar as their king and wherever the Muslim army would won they used to give the order of banning the cow slaughter. So both of them respected the feelings of each other and this naturally alarmed the Indians, they, this, this naturally alarmed the, the Europeans and they started believing that you know we if we want to live in if we want to live in india for a long time we will have to ensure that these people are divided and therefore they started the policy of divide and rule they first you know started uh, you know siding with the hindus because they found they, they they said that the muslims are responsible for the revolt later on in early early you know 20th century they started appeasing the so this ends the first part of this lecture which is the revolt of 1857. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update from Seville State.